Los Angeles Times article about him last July quoted an admirer as calling him a Chinese Martin Luther King. He has spent more than three decades championing the cause of Asian American civil rights. L. Ling Chi Wang has, among many other things, been instrumental in convincing the U.S. Supreme Court to require bilingual education in public schools, in persuading the College Board to offer the SAT II achievement test in Chinese, Japanese, and Korean, and in helping defend scientist Wen Ho Li against espionage charges. He is a respected associate professor at the University of California at Berkeley, and it's nice to meet you, sir. Nice meeting you, too. Can you tell me, um, you've been involved in many battles over the years. Uh, why? What, uh, what has impelled you to, to join these struggles, and what have you hoped to accomplish? I suppose a lot has to do with my uh, own upbringing. Um, I was born and raised in the, uh, in the southeastern city in China by the name of uh, Xiamen, or the English name is uh, Amoy. And it's a fairly western, one of the first treaty ports after the Opium War. So it's quite open to the west. And so I was brought up basically for both Chinese and uh, some western uh, education. And uh, there were certain things in my own background that made me very feel very uh, after giving this kind of activist orientation, for instance, there's a Chinese saying, you know, you know, 不平则明, any time when there is injustice, scream. You know, that's something that I learned from when I was uh, in elementary school, and I continue to have that phrase constantly in my mind. And then, of course, I also came under the influence of, uh, you know, Christianity. Um, I think, in particular, I'm very impressed by the... Uh, you know, the prophetic tradition of the Old Testament, where the prophets are always addressing the society about all the problems, you know, and the, the need to speak out for justice, for equality, that kind of uh, thing. So I, very early on, I had this uh, of a kind of a strong sense of uh, righteous indignation when I see something that's really clearly wrong, and I have to speak out, and then, and then have a determination to try to to rectify things. Do, do you seek out these um, these injustices to scream about, or do they present themselves to you? They usually present themselves to me. Um, in the case of the uh, Supreme Court uh, decision, you know, I saw a very severe problem facing, uh, you know, so some 3,000 Chinese American students in the San Francisco public school who were new immigrants who spoke no English at all, and yet they were being pushed through the school system with absolutely no help from the school. And uh, so after doing some organizing and trying to do some studying and report and lobbying and all that, uh, for several years, to no avail, finally, in 1970, we filed a lawsuit against the school board. And it went to the United States Supreme Court in 1974 in the case of Lau versus Nichols, where the Supreme Court actually delivered a unanimous decision against the San Francisco Board of Education for discriminating against uh, Chinese American children. That's a battle then that went on for the four years it was in the courts and the, That's the, right. the additional years that you were And the battle is still going on. The battle is still going on because yeah. most schools do not comply. You know, it's like the Brown versus Board of Education the Supreme Court decision in 1954. And, uh, you know, today, our schools are even more segregated. You know, it's, uh, and you, you, you win some and you lose some. And the same thing is true in the struggle for bilingual education. You know, California's uh, voters uh, a few years ago passed a proposition, 227, banning the use of bilingual education. On the other hand, because we had the Supreme Court decision, so, you know, people, you know, a lot of school districts continue to offer bilingual education, in, especially in San Francisco. That, uh, that California initiative that banned uh, bilingual education had absolutely no effect whatsoever on the San Francisco public school system because of the... Uh, well, how, how, how could it? I mean, it would be like uh, the, um, passing a law that is unconstitutional or deciding to do away with free speech um, on a political level rather than... Uh, 
through the through the Supreme Court. Right? Yeah, but on the other hand, you look at this country. You know, in 1978, the United States Supreme Court delivered a very important decision on authority action. This is the you know Barkey versus the University of California, my own university, and that decision clearly says that it was okay for university to have authority action policy in the admission process, and yet, you know. Uh, Board of Regents voted to ban affirmative action from the University of California, and this was followed immediately by the so-called Proposition 209 banning affirmative action. So we're still fighting. <laughs> do, 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 does this f frustrate you? I know I've been watching the politics uh, on, at the national level in this country for many years. I came to think that nothing ever gets resolved, that you think it's resolved this year, but next year you find out that it isn't resolved, or it's challenged, or it's changed in this way, or there are loopholes in it that you didn't know about before, so that really it never sort of gets finished. Does that, do you find that? Uh, That's endemic? generally to be true, but I also learn from experience that if one persists, one can always prevail. And, uh, you know, if we look, if we look at the, uh, the Brown versus Board of Education in 54, the Supreme Court said that you know integration with deliberate speed. Mm -hmm. That was the order. And of course, what happened in the subsequent decades was a lot of deliberation with no speed mm -hmm. whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And in the case of Lau versus Nickel, the Supreme Court said that schools must must provide appropriate remedies for these non-English speaking children without specifying what those remedies are. So we're still debating what constitute appropriate and effective remedies. What is appropriate and what isn't? <laughs> Th where does the Wen Ho Lee situation stand? You know, as you know, Wen Ho Lee was, um, you know, uh, I think illegally and wrongfully uh, placed in solitary confinement without any charge or without any uh, conviction or trial for nine months. And uh, subsequently, of stealing that's nuclear right, secrets right, and passing. but he was never charged with that. And then after nine months, the judge summarily dismissed him, although he had to agree to pleading guilty to one count out of 59 that he was charged with of, uh, you know, mishandling of uh, classified data in the lab. Being negligent. So he was free. But, you know, wh when we started working on the Wen Hui case, there were two issues that we wanted. One is freedom for him, and secondly, it's justice for him. Uh, th now he gained freedom uh, in September 19, uh, 2000. But he still had yet to gain, uh, get, obtain justice because, because he, he had to plead guilty to one count under tremendous duress. At the time, his choice was either going back to uh, solitary confinement or be totally free. And so he chose to plead what, guilty to one count. So we are in the process of trying to get President Bush to grant him presidential pardon. Only then, I think, will he really obtain justice. To remove that one smudge uh, yeah. from his name. Yeah. What, what do you think the chances are that you'll get President Bush to do that? We don't know. Uh, it's going to be hard. I actually tried to do that in the last three months of Bill Clinton's uh, administration. That would have been the and, time. Uh, but had I known that you know, all you take is to donate about $300,000, you can get a freedom uh, pardon. Had I known that I would have raised that money without any trouble. I, we didn't know that we go through the route, the regular route, you know, writing letters, petitioning, you know, the president, but, you know, we heard nothing from him. What kind of support? I, clearly, he has a lot of support if you would be able to raise that kind of money in a short period of time. Tell me about a the lot depth of, support. of the support he has. Okay. You know, one holy case is actually quite unique in Chinese American history and Asian American history because if something like this had happened, Let's say uh, another 15 years ago, before that, probably the guy would have been just totally put away and forgotten by everybody. I think there's an increasing uh, you know, political awareness on the part of Asian Americans who have been disenfranchised historically. And case after case, you know, there was the Vincent Chin case in uh, Detroit, there was the Larry Wu Tai Chin case in the uh, Washington, D.C. area. And case after case like that, with virtually no community support. In fact, cases like this, usually when it happened, everybody ran for cover. Because, you know, in American language, we have something called not a Chinaman's chance. Mm. It means that you got no rights, you got, you know, you have nothing. 
and uh, so most Chinese American and Asian American have gotten used to the idea that oh God, you know, if something like that, the best thing is to stay away from it. Keep but not anymore. Straight. Not anymore. I think one case after another, people became much more aware and more willing to stick their their neck out. And I think the one holy case is really a very important case in the sense that a lot of in the past, a lot of scientists and engineers who are Asian American who work in these uh, corporate labs or in university research facilities tend not to want to protest. But I think this Wen Ho Li case seems to have become the last straw for many of them. And so when the call went out, you know, for support of Wen Ho Li, a lot of people responded, you know, donated, you know, well over half a million dollars to his legal defense. When I was trying to solicit, you know, forty thousand dollars in a hurry to put a full case ad to put our case before the the, na the nation, you know, within ten days, I got more than I needed. You know, for a full page ad in the New York Times. So it's clearly out there. And then when I suggested uh, that uh, perhaps, you know, as long as a uh, you know this uh, one holy remains uh, you know incarcerated that no Asian American should apply for jobs in the national labs as a boycott movement against the lab. The boycott is still on, even though one holy has been out for more than eight years, because the conditions that led to one holy case are still there and we're still negotiating with the lab management and the Department of Energy to try to find a way to, 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 to resolve all these outstanding issues dealing with uh, racial profiling racial discrimination in the lab, including, for instance, the labs nearby here, uh, the Brookhaven lab. I mean, but, but more of the attention, of course, has been focused on Los Alamos, uh, Livermore, Van Deer, and Berkeley lab. But actually, we are very concerned about you know, the rights, the employment rights of Asian Americans in these uh, you know, research facilities. What has been the problem? I'm not sure I understand. There are two major problems. One is racial profiling. You mean by relates. the by the government itself, as it uh, as it relates to by employing the, people. By, by the government and by the uh, lab management, racial profiling as it relates to national security. There is a presumption on the part of a lot of people in this country mm -hmm. that if you are Asian, you are not an American citizen, or that you cannot be trusted. Above all, and this is a, this is very important struggle actually. And that presumption e. actually uh, is seen to exist and... and, well, and one OD is a perfect example mm -hmm. because there's, one OD, there's not a shred of evidence against one OD. And in fact, the only reason why he was singled out for prosecution and persecution was on account of his race. There's no other reason. That's why the Justice Department could never build a case against him. Because, but there's a presumption that he was a, he was a foreigner, and he was a potential spy, and he, in fact, from the potential spy to become a real spy. And then, you know, the minute that the, uh, the New York Times on March 6 published uh, his name on the front page of the New York Times in 1999, the next day he was thrown over the fence at Los Alamos lab. No rights whatsoever. And then the next thing was that for the next nine months, 200 FBI was going after him and all his friends, colleagues, relatives, uh, everybody across the country, and they turned out nothing, but they never there still, you know, treated him like a Chinaman, right, and then indicted him, and then put him away for nine months. So this is a, you know, the, so racial profiling, suspicion that somehow if you are Asian, you are automatically either a spy or a thief, whether it be in a government lab or in, even in private lab, you know, there's a lot of private, uh, a pri private lab scientists uh, who are Asian American who experienced tremendous chill and hardship and hostility and suspicion during this whole period from 1999 to year 2000. You know, we're finally beginning to come out of, the, of that. That's one issue, racial profiling. The other one is racial discrimination in employment. If you take a look at these labs, you know, first of all, uh, they are very, very underrepresented. Secondly, if you take a look at their salaries, there's a huge salary disparity. There's clearly a glass ceiling from all of them. I mean, you take that one whole as an example. You know, at the time when he was fired, he was getting 82000 A re very respectable middle class 
uh, income a year. And yet, when you consider his background, he has 20 years of Los Alamos experience working on highly classified uh, weapon research, and he had a PhD. Okay, this was in 1999, 83,000, 20 mm -hmm. years PhD. My student in Berkeley, with a bachelor's degree, zero experience, the starting salary is 70,000. 70. So how do you explain this kind of disparity? You know, there's a serious problem in these labs. It, it sounds as if uh, there are many more struggles ahead for you. <laughs> they, they are presenting themselves all the time. Thanks very much for speaking with me. Thank you. You're welcome.